Okay, so this is chapter 8, and from looking at the note packet, you can see that this is going to take us all the way into chapter 10, because a lot of these concepts go together. And in today's lesson, I'm going to break it down and cover objectives 8.1 through 8.5, and that's also going to include lattice energy. So let's begin by just a quick overview of bonding for some of you that have been away from Regents Chem for um, a while now. So remember that we have ionic, covalent, and metallic as our three major types of bonds, and ionic is between a metal and nonmetal, covalent is two or more nonmetals, and metallic just has to do with metals. Remember that covalent can be broken down into polar and nonpolar, and within our nonpolar molecules we have London dispersion forces that exist, and these are very weak, and in our polar molecules we have hydrogen bonding, which takes place with um, hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, which is going to be a strong intermolecular force. And then we just have our dipole-dipole force, which is a slightly positive and slightly negative. And we're going to go through these in a little bit more depth. I just wanted to give you an overview. So we're going to be looking at types of chemical bonds, and we're going to be looking at the energy associated with bonds. So one way we can calculate energy is to actually look at the bond energies, the energy associated with two different elements that are bonded together. Another way that we can do it is through Coulomb's law. And what Coulomb said was, just say using the example of sodium and chlorine. So you know that when you have a sodium ion and a chlorine ion, they react to form sodium chloride solid. And there is energy associated with that interaction of those ions. And we can calculate that energy using Coulomb's law, where Q is equal to the charge on the ion. R is equal to the radius or distance between the centers of the two ions. So it's either like the radius of the two ions combined. So if this is an A, so this distance plus, say, this distance. Well, I should draw these touching. That's the first thing. Just so you know what we're talking about. And this is the center, and this is CL. So it's this distance right here. So it's the radius of the two ions put together, or the distance between the ion centers. and this is measured in nanometers. And K is a constant. So if we were to do this using sodium and chlorine, we have K times plus one times negative one. So we've got K times plus one, negative one, and let's say the radius between them, using what's in the book, is 0.276 nanometers. And what we actually come out with in this case is E equal to negative 8.37 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the ion pair has a lower energy than the separated ions. And this makes sense, 
because when things react, the overall system wants to achieve the lowest possible energy. And what holds this together is electrostatic attraction. All right, now we're going to get into ionic bond diagrams. So in ionic bonds, we know that there is a transfer of electrons. So to give you an example of that, I'll just use the NaCl. You have Na with one electron, and it's going to give that up to Cl with its seven and it's going to form a bond and the diagram, the Lewis dot diagram looks like this. Remember, for those of you that have been away from it for a while, the brackets always go around the nonmetal and both ions have to have their charges. Covalent bond diagram is a sharing of electrons. So for example, if I have Cl2, a molecule of Cl2, I've got Cl with its 7, and then I have another Cl with its 7. So this chlorine is happy with 8 and this chlorine is happy with eight because they are sharing the two in the middle. We can also draw this as Cl, Cl, and you can see that the bond line in the middle represents the two electrons that are being shared. In a metallic bond, we have metal um, atoms in a sea of valence electrons. So let's say, for example, I have a bunch of gold atoms. And you know that there are moving electrons in between that. It's referred to, when we talk about metallic bonds, as a delocalized <clears throat> electron model, which means that there isn't a specific location for an electron. And so what happens is it creates a temporary, you can see that there's more negative charge over here, temporary negative dipole, and say a temporary positive dipole and these opposite charges are attracted to one another causing the metal atoms to stick together. Sodium hat. It is in your textbook. In my textbook it's page 354 and yours it's going to be either right before that maybe right after it because I have a few extra pages but I wanted to at least go over this because it reinforces Coulomb's law and what it's showing as the interaction of two hydrogen atoms come closer together um, how the energy changes so you can see that when the hydrogen atoms are sufficiently far apart, there's really no enter, uh, interaction. The energy is zero. And as the atoms begin to interact, they move closer, and the energy of the system starts to change. Now, the energy decreases until the distance between them gets right here where we're at 0 0.074 nanometers and then begins to increase again due to 
repulsions. So at first they're too far apart, so there's no attractive force. Then as they start getting closer together, there's the attraction of the one nuclei for the electrons of the other. So there's some energy changes. And then when they get too close together, they start to repel one another again. This distance right here represents the H H bond length. And that is the bond length is the distance at which the system has minimum energy. And that is what we are interested in. All right, now that I wrote in my space for electronegativity difference, So we know that electronegativity is the attraction of the nucleus of one atom for the electrons of another atom. Attraction of one nucleus for the electrons of another atom. And that has a measurement attached to it. You use that table in Regents Chem. Now remember, in order to have electronegativity value, you have to participate in bond formation. And we know from experience that the noble gases do not have electronegativity values. And that's because they don't participate in bond formation. So what is the trend? Well, we know that electronegativity increases as we go across and it increases as we go up. Remember, the bully of the electronegativities is fluorine. It has the highest electronegativity value of 4.0. The lowest is francium, 0.7. Now this should make sense because fluorine is relatively small, meaning when it bonds with something else, its nucleus, there's a relatively short distance between the nuclei of the two atoms because it doesn't have a lot of principal energy levels. So that magnet is pretty big, whereas francium, or francium, however you want to say it, has seven principal energy levels. The nucleus is quite far from the electrons of another atom that it might bond to. So how do these electronegativity values affect bond polarity? Well, as we've already said, you know that there are three types of bonds, ionic, polar, and nonpolar. Let's review some terminology that you're going to see in the book. First of all, we have dipole, which means two poles, which means that we're going to have a partial positive and a partial negative. A dipole moment simply refers to a polar substance. And this dipole moment is usually in the direction of the more electronegative element. For example, if I have H and I have Cl, this is a polar bond. Why? Because the electronegativity, chlorine, 
is closer to fran fr fluorine is going to be slightly negative. This side is going to be slightly positive. So my dipole moment is in the direction of chlorine. Please remember that the arrow head always points toward the side with the higher electronegativity. The tail of the arrow is crossed and looks like a plus sign and is on the side where the molecule is slightly positive. This is what a dipole moment looks like. And then an, a polar bond is characterized by unequal sharing of electrons or an unequal charge distribution. A polar molecule the bond must be polar. The shape must not cancel out. So therefore it is asymmetrical. So let's look at a few examples. The first one that we're going to look at is water. Water is polar. So if I draw water, I have H So let me review how I did that. You know that H has two electrons, but so sorry, one electron, and there's two of them, so that's a total of two electrons, and we have one oxygen, and there's six electrons, so I need a total of eight. So the first thing, the first thing that I'm going to do is draw oxygen with six electrons around it, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the H came in on each side with its one electron. And now each H is happy because it has two, and the oxygen is happy because it has eight. However, if we look at the electronegativity value, and I'm going with the most current electronegativity values, hydrogen is. 2.2. Oxygen is 3.4. So the electronegativity difference between them is 1.2. This falls, if we look at the top, within the polar range because nonpolar is 0 to 0.4. Polar supposedly 0 0.4 to 1.7, greater than 1.7 is ionic. And please, do not consider this a hard, fast box, okay? It's more of a continuum. So you can see as the electronegativity increases, we become more ionic. So going back to my drawing of water, that means that... The oxygen side of the molecule is going to be slightly negative, the hydrogen side slightly positive. So if I were to draw a dipole moment, it would be in the direction of the oxygen. Okay, let's look at NH3. I'm going to start like I'm starting right from scratch. N has five electrons. I have H, and I have three of them times one is a total of three electrons, so I need a total of eight electrons. I'm going to draw my nitrogen, one, two, 
three, four, five. H comes in here. H comes in here. H comes in here. Notice we have eight now for nitrogen. Each hydrogen has two. It's happy, stable, content. When I look at the electronegativity of nitrogen, it is 3.0. Hydrogen is 2.2. That gives me electronegativity difference of... 0.8. That means it is going to be polar. Notice how N is pulling in this way and this way on the H's. They are going to cancel out. Here, the N is pulling up in the upward direction on the H. and there is nothing to counter that. Therefore, this side of the molecule is going to be slightly negative. This side is going to be slightly positive, And my dipole moment will be in this direction. Last but not least, CO2. Carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen, there's two of them, times six is 12. So that's a total of 16 electrons. Carbon dioxide is one of those that you had to memorize from Regents Chemistry. It can, has a double bond on each side of the carbon. Otherwise, the carbons and the oxygens would not achieve eight. Another way that this can be drawn is you can just put the double bond here and then put your electrons in. So what do we have going on here? We have carbon with an electronegativity of 2.6, oxygen with 3.4. So what's happening here is Oxygen's pulling out this way and pulling out this way. This is an equal and opposite force. Therefore, this is a nonpolar molecule. There is an equal charge distribution. And it is asymmetrical. Now, I need to point something out that's very important. Although the overall molecule is nonpolar, if we were to examine a bond between C and O, this would give us an electronegativity difference of 0 0.8. So the individual bond within the molecule is polar, but the overall molecule is nonpolar, and that's important that you understand the difference. Okay, I think something got cut out of your packet because in mine I have the diagram with the radius, but I didn't have the 8.4 um, at the top. So you may have to write this off to the side. So I wanna talk a minute about electron configurations and sizes. Ions have different sizes than atoms. We know that. Why? Because ions have a different number of electrons. Positive ions have lost electrons. Negative ions have gained electrons. So a cation, which is a positive ion, are you positive you lost the cat? The ion is smaller than the actual atom that it came from because it lost electrons. Anions, which are negative from the same element, are larger.
So let's look at why that happens. Here you can see as we go down a group, ionic radius is increasing, just like atomic radius would. Why? Because we're increasing the number of principal energy levels. As we go across a group, we can see that our ionic radius is decreasing. Why? Because our nuclear charge is increasing. When I have a greater nuclear charge and I'm in the same period, I'm going to have a smaller radius. It's kind of like the babysitter analogy. Think about it. As we go across a period, we're increasing our nuclear charge. So we're increasing the number of our babysitters while our electrons are in the same space. So I've got more babysitters to watch kids in the same space so we can have a tighter rein on those kids and reel them in. All right, so let's look at what we have down here. Example, rank the following in order from smallest to largest. So the first thing that we want to do is figure out how many electrons these have. Well, sodium has 11 protons, right? 11 protons and 10 electrons. So that's 10 electrons. So it's going to look like neon. Magnesium has 12 protons plus 2 means it lost 2 electrons. It's going to look like neon. Aluminum, number 13, 13 protons, 3 plus, also lost now three electrons, it's going to look like neon. And you can see that oxygen gained two, fluorine gained one. So all of these look like neon. Now isn't that a problem? All right, so first of all, I want to bring in a vocabulary word that we learned recently, and that's called isoelectronic. And that means same, because iso means same number of electrons. So all of these are isoelectronic, and they all have 10 electrons. But what's different about them is their nuclear charge. So as I said, sodium has 